Well, the Super Bowl, another woke football fest. A poll that was just released by Convention of States and the Trafalgar Group shows 84% of voters want to keep politics out of the Super Bowl. I've invited my friend Mark Meckler, the president of Convention of States, on the show to discuss this with me. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. All right, you guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. I know a lot of you guys know that for the last several years, the Super Bowl has gone woke. But interestingly to note, most football fans don't want to see this garbage. Uh, Mark Meckler is here to talk about this with me. For, for those of you who don't remember, Mark is a friend of mine, but he's also the president of Convention of States. And they've got over five million supporters and activists representing every state legislative district in the nation. Mark appears regularly on television, radio, and online discussing conservative grassroots political perspectives, and I'm happy to have him here. Hey, Mark, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Yeah, I'm all over the place, but this is my favorite place, so I'm glad to be back with (laughs) you. I'll give you 20 bucks later. That was very nice of you. Fair enough. So tell everybody, so you're, you know, it's been a while since you've been on my show, and we're coming up on, I don't know, 18 million downloads now. So we've had a few more listens since you've been here last. Tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to. Sure. Again, my name is Mark Meckler. I'm the president of Convention Estates. Uh, Prior to that, politically, I was the founder of Tea Party Patriots, one of two founders and and national co-national coordinator of that organization. Back in 2012, I decided to strike out on my own. I was really frustrated. I felt like the Tea Party movement had become co-opted by a Republican party that I didn't feel like I belonged in. The left had vilified it. The right had co-opted it. And I just kind of stood in the middle wanting to help the American people, just regular folks like you and me. I founded something called Citizens for Self-Governance. First thing we did is we raised a million dollars and gave it away to grassroots Tea Party groups who really hadn't gotten any money out of the Tea Party movement. Mom and pop grassroots groups that needed 1500 bucks to rent their facility for the year. So we helped a bunch of people like that. Second thing I did was something I don't recommend, which is I (laughs) sued the IRS. Ooh. And... uh, So we did that on behalf of all the Tea Party groups that got targeted by Lois Lerner and her IRS. Ultimately, uh, got a $3.7 million class action settlement out of the IRS. The only one I'm aware of ever happening. And then along the way, I decided there had to be a different way to fix the American system of governance. Elections, while important, weren't fixing the problems that ail the nation. Uh, Mike Ferris, the founder of the homeschool movement in America, I know a good friend of yours, introduced me to the idea of calling an Article 5 convention. I realized that the uh, framers, the founders put this in there because they knew eventually the federal government would become unresponsive to the people. We'd have to do something about it ourselves. So we founded together the Convention of States project. That was back in 2013. Today, there are, as you said, over 5 million people involved. It takes 34 states to call a convention. Right now we are at 19 and a half. So we're well over halfway there. Wow, that's exciting. And you guys generate quite a bit of interest. I know I, we were just talking about this before we started recording. There are a lot of people that either don't understand Convention of States and there are people who are you know, vehemently against the Convention of States. But can you explain to listeners who are like scratching their heads going, Article 5, what's he talking about? Uh, what, what, it, what would it mean to call Convention of States? Yeah. And look, if folks don't know about this, I don't blame them. I graduated from law school without really knowing anything about Article 5 of the Constitution. Uh, people don't know about the Second you know, yeah. the second Amendment <laughs> in this country anymore. We, we forgot about free speech. That apparently is not a thing. So yeah. it's not surprising people don't know about Article 5. So Article 5 is gives us the processes whereby we can amend the Constitution of the United States. We have 27 amendments so far. Most folks know that. Those were all done through the first part of Article 5, which says that when two-thirds of both houses of Congress want to propose an amendment, they can vote to do so. They send it out to the states for ratification. It takes 34 states to ratify. Unfortunately, the one thing that Congress will never do is limit their own power. They're not going to propose an amendment, for example, for a balanced budget amendment or for term limits or for anything that restricts their, their what is now absolute authority. And so if we want to rein in the federal government, I think we have to do more than elect good people. In fact, I think we've proven that's not enough. We're going to have to take the power back ourselves. So the second clause of Article 5 says that when two-thirds of the states want to gather in convention, they pass resolutions in their legislature saying that, so that's 34 states, then they can gather in convention and they can propose amendments the same as Congress can. And then those amendments go out for ratification by three-quarters of the states. So that's the project that our organization is running. 
Uh, right now, as I said, we're at about we're at 19 and a half states. Uh, the half is Wyoming, which just passed out of the Senate. We're moving over to the House. The proposal says that you could discuss anything that would impose term limits. That's on Congress, but it's also on the deep state. And we're all really horrified by what the deep state has become. So you could impose term limits on bureaucrats and staffers like Fauci, who was never meant to be. There Wouldn't for, that yeah. be something? I like to call him Father Fauci, the high priest of the branch Covidians. Which is absolutely correct. I love that, by the way. I'm going to borrow that from you. <laughs> uh, so you look the, the founders never intended for somebody like Fauci to be in office for 40 years uh, through five administrations. Just really outrageous. Mm -hmm. We can limit that. We can impose a balanced budget amendment, tax caps, spending caps. And then the last thing, and, and in my opinion, the most important, we can impose scope and jurisdiction restrictions. You know, the Constitution had what we call enumerated powers. It said, these are the mm. things the federal government can do, and they can't do anything else. There were 17 of them originally. I think today, because of the courts, there are 17 million of them. The federal government does everything. The way to put that back in the box is to call a convention and to limit those powers. So that's what we're doing with Article 5 right now. Well, it's pretty exciting, and it's starting to really catch on. I think people are realizing, I just heard uh, the president of the American Family Association give a speech the other day from Washington, D.C., and he basically said, listen, what happens in D.C. is important, but we're shifting our focus because we recognize how completely and utterly broken it is. And there was never a better place to see this than on the floor uh, of this, of Congress the other night when uh, Joe Biden, who can't string two coherent sentences together, gave his uh, ridiculous State of the Union address, was filled with lies, but was embarrassing to me. I was looking at it like, you know, the Republicans are there, you know, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who I have, you know, a fair amount of respect for, looked like Cruella DeVille. And <laughs> Like, you know, her or whatever yeah. it was she was wearing. And she's screaming at him, you know, you're a liar. It's, I just want to know. I, I told my husband, I only watched it for a few minutes. I told my husband, I'm like, when are we going to take the business of the nation seriously again? Because this seems like a soap opera to me now. And I think that's where uh, we start talking about Convention of States because you realize these guys are unhinged and they're not doing the work of the people anymore. Yeah, I agree with that. Like, I really hate the State of the Union address anyway. It used to be Worthless. done in writing. I mean, that's Jefferson delivered the State of the Union address in a letter. Right now, it's so much pomp and circumstance. It feels mm -hmm. something more akin to a monarchy. The king walks in. Everybody shakes his hand. So I true. expect to see people on bended knee. You see him kissing cheeks as he goes down the aisle. Well, you did see, come on now, you did see Jill Biden kissing someone who wasn't her husband on the lips. That was weird. That was, uh, yeah, I don't really even understand that one. I don't that even That was know. a little awkward moment. It I'm was very, an accident, but she looked okay with it. I don't know. <laughs> It was very odd, but it fits right in with the whole scene, which is oh just my. weird and creepy and not appropriate for a constitutional republic. And then, as you said, we have a president who can't string two sentences together. Uh, when he does one in a row, it's just a lie. It's almost all lies. Yeah. Uh, you know, he openly lied about the Republicans' position on, on Medicaid social and security. social security. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah really heard, outrageous yeah. stuff. And so I just find the whole spectacle disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing good that came out of the whole night really was the response by Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And that's a really hard spot to be. You know, you do this often as I do, just stare into a camera and talk. Yep. And it's weird and it's awkward if you're not used to it. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> and imagine following the State of the Union with all its pomp and circumstance, a room full of people. And then it's just you sitting in a room with a camera. It's kind of a losing proposition. And we've seen people take a lot of heat for it in the past. Man, she hit it out of the park. She yep. was so sincere. She comes across as such a regular American. And I think she said what should be the theme from here through 2024, which is we now have a choice to make. And it's the choice between normal and crazy. And frankly, I choose normal because that's what most of the American public wants. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, I've been working with some friends in Southern California uh, trying to address the war on women. And we've, you know, they're releasing a series of videos about women and how important it is that we stand up and say, I'm a woman. This is my experience. I've actually had a baby. Hey, hey, men cannot have babies. Men cannot menstruate. Men can nor not normal man want to do that. Right. But here we are living in crazyville. Where if I if I stand up on the streets of uh, Portland, Oregon, and I say men cannot be women, they're going to call me the fascist and I'm the liar and I'm the bigot and I'm the crazy person, right? They gaslight people who know that they're right and try to make you think you're the one that's in the wrong. 
we really are living in unprecedented times in the United States. Yeah, I never expected to see anything like this in my lifetime. And it is reality is not reality. I, I mean, it's the strangest thing. We used to be able to debate issues and we would take different positions on the issues, but you could be pretty sure that your opponent, your political opponent was still reality based. I'm not even willing to argue with somebody about men and women and trans no. and no. There, there's no such thing. I'll say this openly. I get a lot of heat for it. There's no such thing as a trans person. No, <laughs> you are no. born, whatever you're born, God made you whatever he made you. And that's permanent. You could have a fantasy that you could be a man who has a fantasy of being a woman. I'm not going to indulge in your fantasy. Feel free to do whatever you want. Right. I'm not going to try and stop you from that, but I'm not going to participate in that fantasy. So what we're trying to do right now is just inject a little bit of common sense back into the American conversation. And I think it's going to require courage. It's one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of what you do and a fan of Convention of States. It takes courage to sort of go against the flow. And we know that what we've been doing now for the last several generations is not working. And this is an opportunity for us to stand up and actually uh, assume some of the authority that the founding fathers wisely gave to the American people. They saw, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And as the size of the federal government grows into this just behemoth that, you know, when you've got uh, Joe Biden, you know, filling a stadium with extra IRS agents, something is not right. And I think most people see it and they're frustrated with what to do. How can people get involved in Convention of States? That's easy. They just go to conventionofstates.com, sign the petition that's there. That'll go to your state legislators and then click on the take action tab. Because really, like Heidi, you know it. I'm really proud of you because you were willing to step into the arena and run for Congress. That's a that's a crazy thing to do in this, You're right. in this day and age. Uh, and I know you have the scars <laughs> to prove it. But look, if people like you don't do that, uh, then we're going to lose the country. So if you go to conventionofstates.com, you click on the take action tab. Get involved. Watching these shows is good. Get some education, but it's not enough. No, it's not enough. And that's the that's why the title of my show is Off the Bench. I've been trying to tell people, get off the bench. Get off. We, we got a bunch of uh, side sitters in the United States, which is how we got to where we are. It's why we've got uh, one of the oldest presidents in the United States who's made a career out of being a politician. The founding fathers never intended for there to be career politicians. You're supposed to leave your job and go serve your country for a little while. What do you think, Mark? I had this idea. What would happen if instead of paying these congressmen and women, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, you said, hey, we're going to give you guys 30 grand a year and here's a bunkhouse. Women get to stay over here and the men can stay over here. That's that's what it should be, because it should be like going to war. You're going to serve your country. You're not going to be served. And it's like we've turned the thing on its head. And I think this is where we sort of created the monster of career politicians. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of that. Franklin actually said if we combine fame and money in into politics, that is the toxic brew. Yeah. You know, back in the early days, folks weren't even paid. Nobody wanted to go to Washington, D.C. because it was a backwater town with very little influence where not a lot happened. Literally until 1913, nobody wanted to go to D.C. because it was just out of the way and it didn't really matter very much what happened to D.C. They didn't have that much power. People cared a lot more about what happened in their state legislatures because it was close to home. That's where the real power was. That's what I'm trying to do is to return it to that where the power resides in the states where people are closer to their seat of government. And that's how it should be. I thought it was really interesting. I I, I haven't I don't have time to count all the lies that Joe Biden spouted at the State of the Union. But one of the things I thought was interesting that he said was he alluded to the federal government as creating jobs. And I was I want to stand up and go, you don't create anything. We create the jobs and then you come and take our money from us and put it into into industries and into causes that we don't like and don't appreciate and don't want. But the government doesn't create jobs. Right. Isn't that one of the one of the main misnomers of what the government thinks it's doing for people? Yeah. And it frustrates me because politicians of both parties say that. I mean, yeah. you hear Donald Trump talk about creating jobs or any Republican. And the reality is the only thing that they do is they get in the way. Mm -hmm. And the way that they allow jobs to be created by job creators is by getting out of the way, lowering taxes, lowering regulations, making it easier for people to get into business and do business. And keep some of their own money. There's a novel idea. Shocking, isn't it? Shocking. The idea that we could keep our own money. And how about future generations keeping their own money? Because yep. that's what they're doing now is they're borrowing from future generations, our kids, grandkids and far into the future will be paying for their excesses today. 
Yeah, it's true. And uh, I'm hoping that more and more people are going to, I think we're starting to see a turnaround. I mean, you said at the onset of the show uh, that you have a reason to hope. And I was like, all right, come be a hope dealer, <laughs> right? Get 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 in here today, Mark, and, and, and infuse the listeners of the Heidi St. John podcast with some good news because I almost always give them bad news right now. It's true. Yeah, look, it's it's hard not to give bad news because you watch the news and that's what everybody delivers to us, right? Right. So my perspective is a little bit different because I spend most of my time traveling around the country. So just the last couple of days, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee. Last week, I was in Cheyenne, Wyoming and Boise, Idaho. Every place I go, Heidi, who I meet are people like you, people who've decided to step into the arena, people who are taking action. I see school boards being flipped from woke crazy to conservative good. I see the parents revolution taking place, which started in 2020 and is continuing strong, taking over school boards all across the country, fighting back against CRT. I see the e, the anti-ESG movement starting to take hold. ESG, you know, this crazy environmental governance garbage where they're forcing corporations to do things that are not in line with business and are not in line with what most people want. No, dude, it's prostitution. It, it is. It's this weird it sort of, oh, I don't care if you don't if you don't want to do that. I own you. And so this is what you're doing. And that's, I mean, it's a kind of a, I guess, a vulgar term for it. But what the government's doing is vulgar. And it's not just the government. I mean, we have private entities doing this, you yeah, know, investment, investment banks like BlackRock that are forcing woke policies. And it's not just BlackRock. It's Vanguard and State Street and a whole bunch of other and they're forcing woke policies on these corporations. Well, there's a backlash taking place. We saw it against Disney. Disney's stock is down last year more than any other entity on the public stock markets. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. they, they've literally, I just saw they fired 7,000 people recently. That's right, on th last Thursday. Yeah. Yep. And so this is positive stuff. They are paying the price for woke. You know, the saying, get woke, go broke. It's coming true. And I think we're seeing it more and more. And we've done polling recently says the vast majority of Americans want their corporations, the people who sell them products and services to stay out of politics. It's not like we're even saying be conservative. Yeah, we're just saying we're just saying, can we just enjoy a football game? Yeah, enjoy football. You know, we just pulled this. The, the polling's incredible on the Super Bowl and sports in general. Uh, it's very rare that we pull something that is so universal. What you see is the vast majority of Americans say, no, I don't want politics in my sports. I just want to root for my sports team. I actually want to forget about politics during a sports game. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering what your, what your thoughts is when, when you, when you read the tea leaves about the uh, Super Bowl, what, what say you? You mean about how yeah, woke? Yeah. I mean, do you think they're going to go, do you think they're going to go, <laughs> you know, 84% of Americans said that they don't want politics in the Super Bowl. I, I'm thinking we're going to see people that refuse to, you know, that they're going to take a knee for the flag. I think we're going to see half-dressed naked people in the halftime show. I don't even watch. Honestly, to me, NFL is no fans left. I'm surprised anybody watches it. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like, I gave up on the NFL when they went woke. If I'm going to watch college fo or football, I'm going to watch college ball, mm -hmm. which I watched a bunch of college ball this year. There's none of that woke garbage in it. Uh, it's all kind of all American. And so I kind of bailed on the NFL. Look, we just saw it in the Grammys. In the Grammys, we saw a full blown Satan worshiping number on the Grammys. I don't watch the whole thing. I just saw some snippets. You even had CBS double down. And, and before the show, they said, be prepared or get prepared to worship. Yeah, they said, we're ready to worship. Un Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So actual, I would just call that out Satanism. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we see stuff like that at the Super Bowl. And I wouldn't be surprised if the ratings are way down because of it. These corporations are starting to pay the price. And the thing about capitalism that's so interesting, it's just like the laws of physics. The laws of economics pan out. Eventually, consumers get sick of it. Your stock price goes down. Your sales go down. That's happened to the NFL. It's happened to other professional sports. We're seeing it in the NHL right now. By the way, I never thought I'd see hockey go woke. Sad. I mean, these are people who pretty much beat on each other for a living. Well, you saw uh, the Portland Winterhawks, right? You watched the Portland Winterhawks and, you know, they used to have, I don't even know what they're, I only knew the Portland Winterhawks because I broke my knee when I was in high school. And so this 18-year-old Heidi gets to go to like physical therapy at five in the morning with the Winterhawks. And I was like, oh my goodness, here I am, you know. And 
what these guys they're they're so woke it's insane right now they've changed their they've changed the logo you can no longer be because they used to be an indian with the winter hawks right now right. it's just a bird because you know cultural appropriation wouldn't want to take that away from anybody it's just bananas and i think we're watching as attendance to these events are just going down 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 disney's going to tell you you know, uh, Bob Iger is going to say, well, it's just, you know, it was a response to the economy. No, it's not. It's a response to your stupidity and not knowing your audience. And I feel the same way is happening in sports. They don't know their audience or they don't care about their audience or maybe both. Well, so again, to me, well, we see all the negativity, right? In that these corporations doing all this stuff. Positive part is they're losing consumers. People are reacting. There's an alternative market developing. You see entities like the Daily Wire just exploding. I was there yesterday. I have some friends who work over there. Every time I walk in the front door of Daily Wire, they've got a huge bullpen when you walk in the front door, you know, a bunch of employees sitting right there. It's a huge facility now. Every time I walk in, it looks completely different. And I'm there probably at least once a quarter. They hired, I heard something like seven people last week. I mean, it's just so by not being woke, by being the response to woke, Daily Wire and many other entities like them are expanding their businesses. Uh, we see it with telephone providers. We see it with entertainment companies, Angel Studios, what's going on with The Chosen. The reaction to the woke and to all the anti-God, anti-family, all anti-human stuff that's going on is very positive and profound all over the country. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this interview with my friend, Mark Meckler. If you want to find out more about the Convention of States, I would encourage you to go to conventionofstates.com and check it out. This is an opportunity for you to find out about Article 5 in the Constitution and see what you can do to bring Convention of States to your area, to your state. Uh, this is a powerful movement, and I think we're only going to see it grow in the days to come. Mark and I are going to come back tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about the state of education and what he sees coming in the years to come. He has some more remarkable insight, and I think you guys are going to be really blessed. So come back tomorrow, and we will air part two of my interview with Mark Meckler right here at the intersection of faith 